<laughs> so thank you, Kimo. Thank you, uh, Lena. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. And even though we are going into this world that is going to be increasingly dominated by technology, technology still has the ability to freak us all out because Microsoft Teams wouldn't let me connect, but et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the experience that I've just gone through as an example of a future customer journey. So how about this? So, for example, we had a problem with we had a problem with Teams. Teams kept popping up error messages. Now, Microsoft should really have been able to pick up on that error message and said you're trying to join a meeting but you're not able to. It could have sent a remote access service request to one of its engineers who could have dialed into my system and actually fixed that. Now, in addition to that, the smartwatch that I could have been wearing could have been measuring the cortisol levels basically in my blood. And as it notices the cortisol levels in my blood increasing, it thinks that I'm getting a little bit more stressed. So it could automatically order a beer from your friendly local e-commerce platform, which could be delivered by drone. So when we start talking about the future of the customer journey, we are collecting more and more information than ever before. If you can aggregate this information together, then you can do some interesting things and you can automate some interesting things, just like I've highlighted. So anyway, getting back onto the reservation, getting back to the actual presentation in hand, uh, I'm going to be talking about the future of the customer journey. So stay with me. Uh, so when we start having a look at all the different stages of a customer journey today, you know, we inevitably have a trigger event. Now, hopefully most of you can actually kind of equate with this. You know, you, you and your partner, have a baby. Yeah, congratulations. It's amazing. You know, and what is the first thing that you think of doing? I mean, outside of going to the pub, obviously. Changing your car. Now, you know, as a young couple, the car that you used to have basically is no longer fully fit for a family. You know, this is just a two-seater Lamborghini. You probably need something with a little bit more space. Am I right? So, Anyway, you figure out that you've got to get rid of your sports car because it's just not practical any longer. So you go out into the world, you go and have a look, you, and you have a look around, you get awareness. And as you're having a look around, you think, you know, who can I talk to to try to figure out what car is right for me? So you organize a cocktail party. Why not? You know, why, just not, why not just speak to your friends when you can actually get them around, basically, you in a, a cocktail party? So you invite all your friends to a cocktail party. You say, you know, what sort of family car have you got? What car have you got? And all your friends tell you all of this information. Now, meanwhile, platforms like Facebook are actually profiling all of your friends and they know the demographics and the kind of profile that your friends have. So they know that your friends all have particular type of vehicles. Uh, so we call this the M plus one effect. So even though you don't know it, even though as you start going through the customer journey, because we understand what your friends' preferences are, we can kind of assume that some of those preferences are going to be shared by you. We go deeper down into the rabbit hole. We crank out basically the browser. We go to Google. We search best family car. I get 1.4 billion hits. That's actually a real number. It's not made up. You can try it for yourself. And I sort through that. I sift through that. I read thousands of reviews. And frankly, this kind of experience here just seems a little bit old hat because I'm just doing loads of web surfing. I'm doing loads of reading. You know, it's a grind. You know, I've got better stuff to do with my time. So then I sort of skip platforms. Now, you know, I go to my smart TV. It knows my preferences. Basically, it's connected to all these over the top channels and everything else. And I decide that I want to go and watch some car programs, maybe Top Gear, uh, you know, and other sort of popular programs. Uh, so I watch Top Gear and the system knows when I'm pausing content. It knows what content I'm more interested in and than, than other sort of content. So this starts, this system is already gathering data and it's saying, well, Matthew seems to be showing more of an interest in this particular type of car. Um, and that's going back to the mothership in the cloud. So I switch platforms again. So I pick up the iPad, but I go to YouTube. So now I'm starting to search again, basically, for best family car, and I'm looking through all the different reviews, I'm looking through all the different YouTube channels and everything else, and I'm watching lots and lots of different content. 
All of this is increasingly getting monitored, it's all getting captured, it's all getting analyzed and sent back to the big Google mothership in the, in the sky. So as we go down the rabbit hole further, I'm still not really sure what car is right for me. I'm sort of in this awareness and exploratory phase. You know, I think, hey, why don't I just ask a friendly artificial intelligence? Now, I'm not gonna say the name of this particular AI because I don't want all of your AIs to start buying and ordering different things, let alone cars, that'll get expensive. So now, as we start seeing the rise of conversational AI and conversational commerce, I can kind of cut out a lot of that administrative administration that I had because I can now say, insert the name of your favorite smart speaker here, um, I'm looking for a family car, um, what would you recommend? And these artificial intelligences are absolutely superb at gathering together huge amounts of information, processing it, and then coming up with an answer for you particularly as we get into conversational AI, and we'll see more of those start coming, starting to come through towards the tail end of this year and 2022. So anyway, I'm now having a little bit more of a natural flowing conversation basically with the artificial intelligence, and it's saying, well, you know, have you looked at this car? Have you looked at this car? And I said, well, you know, tell me a little bit more about car one. You know, is it available in red? You know, what's the engine size? You know, what's the MPG? All this kind of thing. The system can even start asking me questions. So now it's much more like having a conversation with a friend who has infinite knowledge. But not satisfied with that, I dive into the wormhole even more and I start cranking up my digital human. And my digital human is essentially a platform like my smart speaker, insert the name here, um, but it's got a human face. It behaves in a human-like way. It can have a human-like conversation. It's a much more natural interface. We actually kind of call it the human OS. This is Neon from Samsung, just to sort of give you a little bit of a taster about these digital humans. Hi, I'm Neon. Artificial human. It's a little bit different from an AI. I was computationally created based on how real humans look and behave. Every Neon has a unique personality, emotion, and intelligence. I'll help you find your style. I'll let you know what's happening around you. I'll guide your journey. I'll help you find your inner peace. I'll be someone you'll share your idea with. My dream is to help humans become even more human than ever before. And frankly, after my Microsoft experience, I need a digital human that can give me some inner peace. So anyway, um, so these digital humans, basically, in the main, are not pre-programmed. Some are, so a little bit like your sat-nav has pre-programmed responses for whatever it is that you're actually up to. Increasingly, digital humans like the ones that we see from Neon, Soul Machines, and others, actually have neural network brains, which are modeled on the human brain, which is what actually helps them become, look and sound increasingly lifelike. So. I'm now going to show you a digital human that Mercedes have been using uh, to help their customers come to a decision. So this is Cora from Soul Machines. Hi there. Hello, welcome to Mercedes Benz. I'm here to help you with your new car. Which model have you decided on? Mercedes CLS. Great choice. Would it be helpful to run through some questions to find the best option for you? That would be great. Okay. How old is your current car? It must be about two and a half years. How often do you replace your car? Okay. I have an option that could suit you well. It's a Mercedes Benz lease. Perfect. Thank you very much. Have a great day. If you need more help, you can reach me anytime. Now, this kind of brings us all to one thing. You know, as we start having a look at how we collect all the different data points along the customer journey, the customer journey is starting to fragment basically from web based to voice based to digital human based to smart TV to smartphone, etc., etc., etc. And 
Trying to track what your potential customer is interested in, what they are looking at, what they are doing, what you might actually show them is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, now, when we look at the data points that we've get, got just off these sort of different uh, platforms, for example, with Soul Machines Cora, they can use the cameras that are in either your smart products, your smart devices, smart gadgets, and so on and so forth, to figure out what your emotions are. So if Cora is t walking you through a particular Mercedes-Benz specification and you look like you're disinterested, like many of you probably are uh, when you're having a look at my presentation, um, she can start saying, well, you know, maybe there's a different Mercedes I could interest you in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not just capturing flat data. We're starting to capture biometric data, biomarker data, basically emotional data, health and well-being data, demographic data of all kinds of shapes and forms. And this leads to truly thousands of different data points. Just like my uh, smartwatch example, if you can track that I'm starting to get stressed when I'm looking at a particular advert or thing online, you can probably figure out that that's probably not the thing that you should be selling me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the experience that you should be delivering me, perhaps. And of course, when we start having a look at all of these different devices, the one thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is the smartphone. And increasingly, the sensors and the different data points that these smartphones can actually capture goes well beyond just the GPS movement and posture data that these can capture. They can capture everything from the rate of the rate that you type at, the angle of your phone, the angle that you hold your phone at actually gives platforms like Facebook insights into your posture, but also your mental health the number of times you pick it up, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the amount of data that we can collect on customers is truly insane. And that's today, let alone before when we, when we start having a look at the future of online and offline privacy, which is a little bit of a different conversation. Um, so anyway, what we've done is, you know, we've gone through this customer journey so far. We've captured huge num amounts of data about whatever it is I'm interested in. Um, but as marketers, yeah, how do you personalize every single piece of content that you show your customers at scale, in parallel, for next to zero cost? You know, today, it's pretty much impossible. But this is where we have the advent of what we call creative machines. Creative machines are artificial intelligences that are able to increasingly create what we call synthetic media. So you might know synthetic media along the lines of deep fakes, um, but synthetic media as a trend goes well beyond that to the creation, to the artificial intelligence generation of images, graphics, copywriting, scripts, you know, all kinds of different things. So what we can now start doing is we can now start using these artificial intelligences who are capturing and analyzing data about the different points within the customer journey to create adverts, both static adverts and video adverts. Um, they can do copywriting. With Facebook, some of the copywriting that artificial intelligence has done actually boosted companies' returns by 50%. Um, graphics, um, scripts, I'll give you a little bit of an example on that one in a moment, as well as ad placement. So for example, platforms like IBM Watson can place your ads for you. Um, based on your demographic, your target audience, you know, your particular preferences and all that sort of stuff, and it can do it automatically. So increasingly, this sort of part of the customer journey is becoming increasingly automated. Now, that's both an opportunity and a threat, depending on which part of the value chain that you sit in. Um, so for example, we have an artificial intelligence that has actually now created a static platform advert, a little bit like this one here. Fun fact, in Russia, and artificial intelligence was putting together ads, especially for clients for over a year. All the clients thought it was excellent, but none of the clients actually knew it was an artificial intelligence that was doing it. So we have AIs that can create static form adverts. Now, as I'm starting to walk past, say for example, a smart billboard in a smart city, my proximity to a particular billboard can now start showing me a car advert because all these systems are joined up and connected and it knows that I've been looking at cars so it shows me this car advert as for example I stand outside this particular restaurant. So advertising is literally following us about in lots of new ways not just the online rather creepy way. Um, artificial intelligence is also getting increasingly adept at creating deep fake 
full-bodied digital humans from scratch. So these, for example, digital humans are being created by a platform in Japan. Um, and if I've been looking at clothes, for example, then these AIs can put the right clothes on the right model, bearing in mind your particular demographic and your preferences and everything else. And you can actually see these being rendered in real time. And then these can be shown to you across any platform that has a connection, which is all of them. Um, now, in addition to that, you know, we have AIs that are increasingly capable of putting together realistic influences. So this is uh, one particular influencer. So what we have is we have an artificial intelligence, in this case combined with a CGI platform, that creates all of these different pictures of this virtual influencer. So now we don't really need to pay actual influencers loads of money to push my wares, because I can do this stuff increasingly automatic. Now, this particular uh, digital influencer basically is a girl called Lil Michaela. She has 3 million followers. She's actually a millionaireess in her own right because companies like Diesel and Prada have actually been using her to promote all their goods and wares. Um, she's programmed unlike some of the other digital humans that I showed you. But increasingly, you know, we start using these virtual influencers you to guys, create stories for customers. I've been up super late. I'm barely recharging my batteries. I'm seriously shaking right now. Let's dive into the rabbit hole together, shall we? I'm learning some important stuff, like how am I so chill? They program me with a memory slinging hot dogs at the mall, and no one is more patient than the girls behind the register. But then I open another memory and I'm all confused again. Who are these digital demons? Are there parts of my programming they're trying to hide from me? I'm trying to focus on the stuff that gives me the feels. I can still sing all the lyrics from Ariana Grande's Love Me Harder because of Ben, my ex from high school. Oh, he was my first Never mind. He was my first lots of things, but anyway, I totally forgot about him until I saw him on my USB. Wait, if he's on the USB and these are programmed memories, was any of this real? Did we really? I have to find him. Also, hold up. Is that Jess and Harv in this prom photo? WTF? So digital humans at the moment are principally static. They're moving to dynamic, but when they actually become dynamic, increasingly a digital human is able to put together a hyper-personalized experience for a target, you know, someone who you are trying to advertise to. Um, but they are digital, extend the human experience at internet scale for pennies on the dollar. Um, this is an artificial intelligence advert that was written again by uh, one of the sort of big giant tech companies. The script for this was put together by the AI and then they got humans to actually video it but in the future, you wouldn't need the humans. This actually won awards. At the top of the funnel, we have data collection, awareness, and all that kind of stuff. Increasingly, we have artificial intelligence, which is able to capture and analyze all of that information and create hyper-personalized content for the right place in the customer journey, whether they are online, whether they're looking at adverts, whether they're looking at video, whether they're looking at static feeds, whether they're reading a news article, that's it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the heavy lifting of this hyper-personalized ad creation is increasingly, and in the future will be more done by artificial intelligence. Um, so we've gone through uh, all of these different stages. As a consumer, I've been bombarded by artificially intelligent generated adverts all over the place. I'm now interested in a couple of different things. Uh, so now I'm going to go to, say, Audi's website, and I'm going to start configuring my car. So this is A5. And this is a car configurator. But it's based on the Unreal Engine, which is a gaming engine. And you can do this with any product. You can do all of it with any product.
So now you no longer have to create actual videos or films because you can use the Unreal Engine to create synthetic video and synthetic content for you. And then of course we have new gadgets. So starting 2023, yeah, when we start talking about the use of our augmented reality and virtual reality experiences, virtual reality is already being baked into glasses. So things that look like sunglasses, uh, because one of the biggest problems that we actually have with virtual reality is the cultural aspect, because people don't want to walk around with giant headsets on. So just as we've seen with augmented reality glasses, virtual reality glasses are already here, courtesy of companies like Facebook. We also have augmented reality glasses like these ones. Generally, they're increasingly wireless. And we also have augmented reality contact lenses from companies like Mojo, which actually are augmented reality smart contact lenses. So gadgets are changing. And as gadgets change, that, in, that starts changing how I, as a consumer, engage with your particular brand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, for example, when we have a look at virtual reality, we have virtual reality showrooms in the car industry. But you can apply this to any industry. You know, shops, retail, we have virtual reality shopping malls in China and Singapore. Who have four and a half thousand stores. So increasingly, computer graphics are photo real and high resolution. That makes a significant difference when, it start, when we start talking about content creation, particularly automated content creation. And one of my favorite examples of a virtual reality showroom is Audi, who actually have a virtual reality showroom that you actually have to go to a physical showroom to actually go and experience. Um, but you can even drive your cars basically in virtual reality while you're in the showroom. So you've done your awareness piece, you've got interested, you've explored, you've gone to virtual reality showrooms, augmented reality showrooms, and anything else basically that you can actually find. It's time to make a purchase. So you decide to buy. And the artificial intelligences increasingly will actually let you buy with your face. In IKEA's case, they will actually let you buy time. So the longer that it takes you to get to an IKEA store in Dubai, the more discount you get, so you pay with time. Um, in terms of things like financing, pre-approved, because we've already got the data on, on you, we know where you live, where you work, basically your demographic background, we know your income stream, we know your credit scores, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if we really want to sort of push the boat out, we can pay by crypto like you can with some Teslas. Um, now, of course, when we start looking at retention, and we're almost there, um, you can use any or all of these different technologies to stay in touch with your customer as they use your products. 
Um, you can use digital humans to fix problems. You can use augmented reality, for example, in a car environment, basically to uh, allow people to hover their smartphone over the engine so they know exactly where to change the oil or the water or whatever it happens to be. So there's lots and lots of different touch points that we can have sort of post-purchase. And then, of course, repeat. And frankly, you just bought a three-seater. Now you need a four-seater. So let's get back to it. So my name is Matthew Griffin. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the journey and uh, I look forward to taking questions.